Welcome back to the Blood and Black Rum Podcast. I'm Ryan from Coastalization.com. I'm joined with my co-host Martin. How's it going? Uh, pretty good. We are back with a new episode of um, this show, and we are going to be doing uh, a couple episodes next. What, what is it like in the next two weeks, back to back? So, uh, just uh, if you're listening, we wanted to get that out there that we're going to be. Com- com- kind of compiling some episodes because I'm going on a cruise. Fancy pants. That's right. And uh, so we're going to be trying to get to uh, both Leprechaun 4 in space to continue our St. Patrick's Day tradition. Although neither of us, I don't think, particularly would like to continue that tradition. We're kind of stuck in the rut here. And uh, we're also going to be doing Captain Marvel, a different kind of rut of superhero movies that we have sort of just fallen into and we just keep doing them because they get them likes that's right and speaking of an even different kind of uh rut or repetition today's episode is on groundhog's day (laughs) no Uh, the other we're late on that. yeah that one's a little too late the other type of groundhog's day film that's out there and i'm not talking about um, the new Russian doll TV show on Netflix either, which is also very much like Groundhog's Day. I'm talking about Happy Death Day, uh, the slasher film from 2017. And no, we're also not referring to Happy Death Day to you, not to be confused with it, which is also out now in theaters. We're very late on this one. So we decided that we were going to do Happy Death Day first. And I don't know, sometime down the line, we'll probably do Happy Death Day to you. Well, we got lucky, um... What do you mean? We got lucky. Because it was Monday the 18th this year. And from the trailers I've seen for Happy Death Day to you, that's what you hear in the beginning. It's like, it's Monday the 18th. Uh Uh-huh. Very interesting. Well, I only brought it up because I've never even heard of this film until like a month ago when my Facebook was littering me with trailers after like I watched like a video on Facebook and like the next video would load and I'll sometimes just let it load and... Where I'm, lay, you know, laying in bed and just watching videos in a row, whatever the fuck. That's probably how Big mm. Bang Theory somehow became a big thing on my hmm. Facebook page. But I was getting littered with Happy Death Day to you trailers. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? And, and You're right. And then and you, like, so but the trailer probably... would just be like, it was a 30 second trailer, but it was like 10 seconds repeated over and over. And she'd be like, it's, it's Monday the 18th again. Oh, no. So you didn't even, did you even know at that point that there was an original Happy Death Day? Or were you just thinking that Happy Death Day to you was just its own entity? Well, from the trailer, I couldn't really glean that much. Right, there's not that much to go Because it was just like, oh no, it's Monday, what? It's Monday the 18th again! And then, like, someone gets stabbed and killed, and then it just go back and, like like I said, for 30 seconds, just repeat. I was like, yeah. Like, what the fuck is, I don't know what the fuck this is. Yeah. Well, it it got your attention. Didn't know it was new, like, there's a new slasher film around. Yeah. It got your attention. Yeah, I'm surprised that you didn't hear in 2017 about this Blumhouse film. Uh, it released on October 13th, which was a Friday the 13th. So it had that going for it. Um, and the other thing that really stood out to me when uh, this came to theaters was the poster artwork for it, which I'll pull up right now. If you look at this poster artwork, it resembles a lot of the classic slasher film posters from the 80s. Uh, one in particular that it stands out to me is um, April Fool's Day, and a similar one would be um, Happy Birthday to Me. Um, so all, both of those, they sort of stand out, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that in some way that was intended. Uh, Blumhouse, even though a lot of people like to shit on Blumhouse because they're like the popular production company at this point, um, they're sort of like the new line cinema of uh, the 2000s and uh, 2010 eras. Because done on a yeah. low budget. Listen. Yeah. For every four bad films they pump out, you get a Halloween. It's true. So it, oh, geez. I, I definitely would not shit on Blumhouse. They, so, um, although you know there are certain things about them that I don't love. I don't love that they have their own uh, horror movie website that is like 
uh, basically sort of promoting their own horror films. I don't love that. But other than that, Blumhouse is a pretty good company, and you're right. I mean, maybe they come out with a couple duds, but in general, they really tend to put out some really good films, even ones that you probably wouldn't expect to be a good film. Uh, I'll be honest, Happy Death Day, I did not expect it to be a good film. Um, I remember, I do remember seeing the trailers, and I remember, uh, I will be the first to admit that seeing that PG-13 rating slapped on there was a bit of a turnoff to me, and it normally is, because I've come to expect, not that PG-13 means, like, the lesser violence and everything is going to be a, a killing point for me, but that PG-13 rating generally means that they're targeting younger audiences on purpose, for whatever reason, because they want to... They make more money. Exactly. They want to increase sales. Um, our, or, fil- our, say our films are the kiss of death. It's true. For, uh, financially, you know. And, and, and I would say that PG-13 films tend to have... Um, less serious themes and less uh their scripts just aren't as good and so that does tend to turn me off when i see that pg-13 rating and then with that said i'm not like gonna avoid it because it's a pg-13 film but i do tend to to immediately think less of it and that's probably something biased on my end that i shouldn't really but in this case happy death day for me when i saw it the first time it was a happy surprise that i was like oh okay you know that was a lot better than i expected it to be um I watched this on a plane when I, and not too long ago, actually, when I went to San Francisco, um, I had about, you know, two hours of flight to kill. So I watched Happy Death Day on the flight for free and uh, was pleasantly surprised. So that was the first time I had seen this film. Um, So I'm not saying that PG-13 movies are always bad, but Blumhouse does tend to come out with quite a few PG-13 movies that are actually pretty good. And they, they do have good premises and at least are thought out and sort of are uh, metacritical sometimes and they tend they tend to be like i said the new line of the 2010s and uh the 2000s except in this case there's more hits than misses and sometimes with new line especially towards the end there were a lot of misses um so yeah i mean how dare you call the mangler a miss well, I'm just saying that towards the towards like the 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 end where they started to crank out some films uh in that sense, inevitably, there are going to be a lot of misses. Which is funny that we we always kind of throw a new line under that bus. It's cliche, but we always do. How come we don't do that with Miramax? I I almost <laughs> said Miramax as well because they were in a similar situation. Um, I I did almost say Miramax. I maybe I didn't say Miramax because new it's line. Like, it's like for more... every, I was saying, well, it's like for every clerks and scream, you get you know right. Yeah, I can't, mm. yeah, I I did almost say Miramax. Um. So you could really use it interchangeably. I know, but New Line, at least for me, New Line sticks out a lot. It is like the, <laughs> the more prevalent of the two, so I felt like more people would be relatable least, to that. At least their stuff's a little bit, at least in my mind, a little bit more prolific. Sure, yeah. Yeah, I mean, f- certainly. I think that's why they stick out in one way, because they were prolific, mm-hmm. and that they, they did release quite a few things, uh, things that still stick around and that we remember. So, uh, But I think Blumhouse is in the same boat. Um they do release some duds, and I uh, I didn't see Truth or Dare, but for just from everything that I saw about it, that looked like a shit show. The, pur- uh, the purges are bad. Um, I will disagree with that in some ways. Um, I did and I did like the first purge. I thought it was okay. Not certainly not something like Funny Games, which I will herald as being one of the best uh, <laughs> home invasion films of all time. But um, certainly nothing like that. But I did find it fun. And then I haven't seen, like, I didn't watch the second I've seen one. The, I've seen the first two. I didn't watch the third one. But then I did watch The Purge. Um, what is it? The pur- the first Purge. That's what it was that I watched. The first Purge. I thought that one was pretty good. Um, pointed. Sure. Uh, uh, in- racially in- incited. Incited. Yes. Um, and I think a lot of people sort of, like, didn't like that part about it. The the actual racial insight into it, like of pitting black people against each other because white people wanted it to be that way. Um, people didn't really love that. They found that like, it was sort of like the, the it's some of that, the things that they call reverse racism. Oh, that, you know, they were killing whites off and stuff like that, which isn't really a thing. And, and, and it wasn't a thing in the first purge and it's, it's it was a stupid argument for people who who found it that way, but um, I did enjoy the first purge as well. So uh, I mean, I the first purge I thought was I mean I I thought it was a nifty idea. 
just not really. Did you watch the first purge? The the oh you mean you mean the literal the first film the original I've first. seen I've, gotcha, only, gotcha. I've only seen the first two that does get confusing yeah, when you no. say the original purge and the first purge it's like which wait which which one are you talking about look but, leave it to Hollywood to have stupid names for films yeah I, I agree know. I agree what's the name what's the name of the first Rambo film the first what Rambo film oh yeah first blood yeah there you go but, what's the name of the second Rambo film Rambo two first blood. First blood. First blood part two. Yeah. Rambo. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then, then then you get Rambo three. But no. Um, no, I agree. But no. Bad uh, so, so I've seen the first purge that came out. Mm. The first in chron- like chronologically. Um, thought it was a nifty idea. You know, it's a, a nifty just, idea. Like, yeah. hey. I just didn't think it was They ex- just didn't focus on the, well. the actual aspect of the purge enough. No, it was too, too kind of smashed in. It could, it could be like a really interesting idea that especially with the way politics are going today you know really interesting idea to explore uh, i just don't think it goes in depth enough and, and, it, and it has enough there enough meat on that bones in the scenario that you're given in that first film um to make it worthwhile and then the second one uh anarchy is anarchy right i think so yeah. uh that was just like kind of a fucking yeah total mess i, did, I didn't see that one and i didn't see election year I didn't see it. No, I yeah. didn't see it. But I, I mean, like, so, I mean, it's like, just, yeah. you know. Yeah, but I mean, like we were saying, Blumhouse definitely got some stuff going for Look, it. Look, even if everything they've ever done was a total turd, Halloween 2018. <laughs> it puts them right back <laughs> on the map. Yeah. So, uh, like I said, happy death day with Blumhouse. Um, certainly, you know, it's a surprise. I definitely didn't think that I was going to enjoy it as much as I did. But um, I think they had some really good ideas going here for Happy Death Day. Um, and I think the uh, the main thing about this film is that it doesn't feel like it's just a ripoff of Groundhog's Day. Because you could really have a film that's so dead inside besides being like, it's a horror film, but Groundhog's Day. Uh, that I mean, you could certainly churn out a movie like that. Would it be successful? Would it be that fun? Probably not. Really I mean, well, people doesn't have Bill Murray. <laughs> yeah, people would be able to see the seams in that and say, like, well, this is literally just a ripoff. It'd be like some of those Italian films from the 70s and 80s where you're like, uh, this is exactly like Escape from New York uh, <laughs> w- without any of the big names and and uh, with, you know, Claudio uh, Damascus or whatever. I made that name up, but... Um, <laughs> it's probably a prolific <laughs> Italian actor. Yeah, uh, but, you know... Some of those where you're just like, yeah, that's a complete rip off. And some some of them were fun. Some of them like uh, espoused their own things like Zombie was a rip off of uh, Dawn of the Dead. And yet that one had like a sort of a lineage of its own. So it certainly can be successful. But Happy Death Day really isn't just a lifeless clone of Groundhog's Day set with a, a serial killer. Uh, it's got definitely got a lot more going on with it. And it certainly seems like Christopher Landon, the director... Uh, Scott Lobdell, the writer, they all really have um, some knowledge of horror film besides uh, just, you know, the basics or, you know, the ones that Blumhouse pumps out. Everybody behind this, and I'm I'm assuming that Jason Blum had quite a bit to do with, like, the premise of this and, and you know, the production on this. Um, everybody seems to really be interested in actually making a horror film and, and sort of um, riffing on some of the the stuff that slasher films used to do. And Still I think do. it shows. Yeah. I, I think it shows in this, in this uh, scenario here uh, that we'll get into, I think in a second, yeah. we'll take a break from uh, happy death day real quick to step aside, do a little uh, excursion into beer territory that we normally do. Uh, we do have a new beer on the show today. Uh, Martin went cheap on us today, and he uh, decided that he's <laughs> going to spend a big old five ninety nine or whatever plus tax, plus tax and, de- and deposit you know, for a new brew. Um, go ahead, take it away. Tell him what well, you got. Because we're going to be drinking so much fancy beer on Saturday, going to have you know our yearly fulfill of IPAs at the Saratoga Beer Summit that we go to every year for eight years now. This beer's been on my radar for a while. And I brought it up to you, but you for- totally forgot about it. Um, Labatt Blue has now proudly released a new beer. And it's their Labatt Blue Hoppy Session Lager Citra. Yeah. Or Labatt Blue Citra Hoppy Session Lager. One of the two. 
The it funny doesn't... the funny thing about this beer that I just think about is like uh I can imagine the brewmaster at Bat Blue who's like sort of this this uh older man who's like literally not uh like not focused on anything, doesn't have a smartphone or anything like that. Just constantly every day coming in and brewing regular Labatt Blue. Life. Which, by the way, Labatt Blue was my staple college beer. Mm-hmm. Being a Bills fan, Genesee and Labatt Blue. Yeah. Um. If you, I mean, you've been to the Ralph a couple of times with me. Mm-hmm. They're not walking around with Bud Light. No. They're not walking no. around with Coors and Miller Light. No, it's the Blatt. They're walking around with Blue Light. It's because they're close to the border. Yeah, right? No. Yeah. Well, I was just saying, like, I imagine this guy who is, like, you know, sort of a like very stoic old man comes in every single day doing the same thing. Yep, we're going to brew Labatt Blue. One day, he just seems to stumble upon a beer. <laughs> and it has citra hops in it. And he's like... Citra hops, the light bulb goes off, and he says, he goes into, like, you know, whoever owns the Bat Blue now. Hey, Bernie! The whole, yeah, like... Bernie! The, the, what if I put the citra hops in here, don't you know? The, oh, eh? Put the hot... Yeah, put those hops in the beer, eh? Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Ta-da! P- problem is, this is made in America. True. I don't even know if they make this in uh, Canada. I have no idea. If I this doubt is, it. If this is just uh, uh, the American... Because I know some of their stuff they do produce and pump out here. I think some of it's actually yeah. done in Buffalo and uh, Rochester. Yeah, it's, it's possible that this did not make it across to, to Canada. They don't They don't make it there. Because they do, they do get stuff like that we don't get. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. What was one of the... Was it, you say, a Bud Light Rattler? Or? Uh, yeah, they, they actually have like... Um, yeah, I can't remember what it was, but it was like a Bud Light it, uh, Lemon Radler or something like that that we don't get here. Uh, something like that. And then they also have like special Labatt Blue ones that we don't get here either. Mm. Um, so, yeah, they do have stuff that we don't have. And then I, I assume that like any American-made Labatt Blue, we, they, this Citra may not be there. I don't know. Uh, Canadians can write in and let me know. Uh, I'll ask Michael too. I'll ask our uh, other Colts Plantation writer, Michael. That was, that was really sad too, because I bought a uh, six pack of blue a couple weeks ago, which I haven't had in forever. And I was just fucking terribly disappointed. Yeah. It just did not hit that. Well, <laughs> hit any spot. Yeah. That I'm using. I haven't really been that great of a fan of Labatt Blue in a while. Probably ever since that we had that flat, really flat draft of Labatt Blue. <laughs> that might literally be. At a wedding. Yeah, that literally may be where that was my death nail. For I know, it. but yeah, just but I got I got it. a six pack of it like a couple weeks ago. I was like, I totally regret doing this. And yeah, I, you know, I uh, yeah, I haven't had it in a while. But the the Bat Blue Citra, uh, certainly tastes like Labatt Blue, and then somebody added some Citra hops to it. It has that very watery. I would say blue light. Yeah, blue, yeah, blue light because it, it it is a lot uh lighter on taste. Um. Uh, it's definitely tastes like, like blue light. Like you're drinking a blue light, and then at the end you get s- smacked with hops. Yeah, yeah. The the end is really heavy on hops, and it actually leaves a pretty bitter taste in your mouth after you know after you swallowed, and you've got you've like, got that last bit of uh, the beer in your mouth. It could almost be like a founder session. Yeah, right? if they kind of mixed it, like, yeah. like pair, paired it better, because it does have like a really hoppy like citra hops presence to it, but. Well, the fact that you get so much of like a light beer taste to begin with, and then you get smack oh like you know smacked upside the head with the yeah. citra hop taste, it makes it really like what the like what yeah. the fuck am I drinking? It, it is it is kind of strange how they just haven't really paired it well together. Where like you get one then the other, it's not like they're mixed that well. Granted, after having a couple, mix is better. It's like if you drink, I think if you have a couple, it's, it's that session it, lager style. Yeah, it, it's yeah. No, the more you drink of it, the better it kind of all melts together. But mm. when you're drinking your first can, not so much. Yeah. You can totally taste, you know, the yeah. the it's very very segregated. It's you know. Light pilsner and then bam hops. And the and the thing about this one too is that it is very thin, uh, as somebody had mentioned before on Untapped, which I would never think to describe. I probably either. wouldn't either, but that's an uh, apt description of it. That it's it's a very thin beer. Like it really has very little mouth feel to it. It it does feel like you're drinking water with a little bit of carbonation to it. And I think that's 
you know, one of the reasons why this isn't really a great hoppy lager. Um, I would rather it have like a little bit more intense mouthfeel to it. At the same time, it does feel like when you're drinking this that you're actually losing calories. Of the 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 uh, <laughs> you're burning, act, yeah, the yeah. act of picking up the can is like lo- you're burning more calories than you're intaking from this uh, very light lager. But and the funny thing is, probably because it's a citra hop lager, it's probably like two hundred. Yeah, it probably probably is <laughs> two hundred yeah. calories yeah, a can. Is. So you're like, ah, hey, yeah, I'm doing yeah. good, yeah, you know. Yeah, uh, the other thing is that it's like it's super low on alcohol content. It's four point seven percent. So even at a session lager, that's still pretty low. I mean, I would say like most session lagers are around more like the five point five mark, something like that. No, like, I would say maybe like five. Five. Really? I think four point seven is still pretty low for a session lager. It's it's higher for a uh, light a beer. light beer, but it's low for a hoppy lager style. I would say. I would. I you know after ha- like I said after having a couple, I might get this again. At first, I didn't really care for it as much, but the well, more the more I'm drinking it, it's the more I'm like. I mean, for the for the price, and for the for the. I mean, I would say that the the taste is not that bad. Where you you I would say you can't beat that price. Well, t- I know, but yeah, if, I, if it's like twenty dollars for a fifteen pack of Founder Session or five ninety nine a six pack of this, I mean the Founders that tap absolutely taste better. But if I'm pinching pennies, like yeah, I mean that'll it's, do, it's, pick, it's, it's pretty know. cheap. So, and I would say that f- the price versus the taste, you can't really go wrong with it. Citra hop also brings out like kind of like a more juicy IPA taste to it too. A little. I wouldn't go so far as to say not it's saying, juicy. No, I'm not saying super juicy. Yeah. Like you know, like a lot, Get a of, little bit of it. But yeah. look, like I said, this beer's growing on me. I didn't really like it at first, but now I've had, now I'm on number three. I actually would say they describe it with a clean finish. I would not describe it as a clean finish. It's a clean start. A, a clean finish to me would be like you get the bitterness, but then it kind of evens out. And I would not say that this has a clean finish. At all. I would say this is like, if you're like experimenting, like if you're new to like craft beer. Yeah, this would be you, a good place to start. This, like, you know, yeah. like, like, like the hop, like different hops. And this like, would be like m- what mine was, was like Bud Light Lime. That yeah, was like this, my, would, this would be a better start though. No, but I'm saying like the, it, it's in a similar vein of like where you might start out if you were just ex- yeah trying to drink beer, like, but like, you didn't like, like it that much. Like if someone was just like, you know... Joe Worker, and they're like, hey, I usually drink Miller Lite, but I'm thinking about trying different craft beer, and I'm, but I'm afraid of all that delicious hop taste to it. You're like, I got a beer for all, you. Although I would be a little bit hesitant to give this to someone who says that they don't really like IPAs, but they want to start trying to get into them, because of that bitter that bitter taste at the end might be a little bit of a turnoff. Because some of the better, but no one, no, no one, no one drinks IPAs for their first no, time. Well, I know, but no, I'm saying like if they say they like beer and they want to get into the IPA style, but they don't know how, I probably wouldn't give them this. I'd give them like a Founders Hoppy Lager or something like that that has a little bit more robustness to it, but also evens out on the bitterness because this has just a little bit too much bitterness at the end uh, that I could see people who aren't really into IPAs being a little bit turned off by it. So the the analogy goes for the same thing of like whiskey and cigarettes. You keep nobody, doing it until you. Nobody likes it. No one smokes their first pack of cigarettes. Like, ah, good rich tobacco. Mm. You know, you do it a couple of times, and after a while, it's like I said, true. It's the same thing with it this is beer. The, it is the same thing. It's with the beer. same thing with this beer. You right? have to keep going. Yeah, yeah. It's the same thing with whiskey. You gotta just keep going until you like it. You know, or pot. No one smokes, you know, the first, first doobie, and it's like, that's... I guess it's, I guess it's possible that you just keep doing it and you never like it, but... Well, that too, but I mean, like you said, That's like a, me, if I was to try to keep eating tuna fish or something, I doubt I'd like it. Listen, canned tuna fish isn't real tuna fish. Yeah. <clears throat> real tuna steaks are delightful. <laughs> <laughs> canned tuna fish is an abomination, and I absolutely hate it, but... Alright. But yeah, so... You know what? As I'm going along, working through number three, I would say give it a try. Try it. I. That's a try. It's not that bad. I mean, we should come up with like a rating system for it. Like, it's a try, not a buy. Try it if it's available, but it's not. It's not a hardcore buy. Yeah, we'll de- debut that in our special episode. Yeah. Or it's uh, we we'll have to come up with something like a little bit more. Uh, uh, linguistic for this uh, for this show, you know something like it's 
It's a Suspiria. Yeah, 1977. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, Not yeah. a God's gun. Lever of Jello. <laughs> it's a God's gun. Don't. Or don't, you go. could just classify on the uh, Gold Bloomian level. Wow. No, Gotta get back to that. We doing s- a Gold Bloomian? We still have quite a few to do that. The man. <laughs> we need to uh, apply a Gold Bloomian scale. That's you know for what? another time. Okay, though. you know what? Now that you bring that up, we'll debut that on our special episode. There you go. There you go. So, can we review his jazz album? Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah. yeah basically, what it's like mean? a little movie in what itself. You, what do you mean? Yeah. It's an hour of Jeff Goldblum going. Mm, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Huh. Oh. Oh, I like that. No. <laughs> <laughs> I can just imagine him at the piano, like, whoa, no. oh, whoa, oh, yeah. I oh. mean, practically every time he showed up in Portlandia, like, that was just, like, him. And Tim and Aaron. Fred and Carrie were like, just be yourself. I wonder if he's going to be in the new documentary now season. They have a lot of guest stars. Fred and, I guess Fred Armisen and, um, and Bill, Hader. Uh, Bill Hader are really not going to be in it that much, so. That kind of bums me out, though, because Bill Hader is probably one of my favorite parts of, uh. Documentary now. So, uh, anyway, we're like way <laughs> off topic here. Oh, uh, right. che- get back on the rails. Get back like, on Jesus. it. Jesus. Yeah. Uh, so, Labatt Blue Citra, check it out. Should be in stores uh, near you. Six, six, six pack of Tall Boys. Uh, have at it. Give it a shot. It's not that, not you know, it's not terrible. So, check it out. Uh, on to Happy Death Day. I do like that we're sort of behind the times because we're going to get the. The press, you know, we're going to get, like, the people that are interested in Happy Death Day to you. They're going to check this episode out. They're going to be like, of course they're going to cover Happy Death Day to you. And it's not. It's going to be the first one. <laughs> and they're going to be disappointed. But it's all right. Um, so Happy Death Day. Fun film. Um, certainly has its place in slasher canon. Um, like I said before, it does seem like everybody behind Happy Death Day had some understanding of the meta criticisms of slasher films and uh in some ways happy death day does remind me of something like a scream no it does it mm. does it does remind me see, it's I, not I, metacritical see, in see, scream see, sense but. see um i saw someone you know like it's saw like a review saying it's groundhog day meets scream now the groundhog's day absolutely yes scream no i get i definitely get the scream element I do. It's no, it's not as it's because it has no sense of meta to it. It doesn't. No, it does. It, you're right. It it's not like a insanely bringing up its own meta elements, but it does understand some of those elements. You can see that it it's using them at play in the film. And one of the things that I I really like about what Happy Death Day's premise allows the film to do is that it really gets to play around with deaths because. Um, in slasher films... Because it's PG-13, so you don't get to see. So well, true. <laughs> but in most slasher films, you're sort of given a killer, and that killer has a, a one significant method of killing. Like in Scream, it was stabbing. And, and I mean, that's pretty generic. But you generally, that killer is doing the same type of killing throughout the entire film. Listen, Jason... Went off the reservation every now and then, slamming. That is pe- true. Slamming people in the trees. Well, that kick- that was in Jason's like later incarnation, kicking boom yeah. boxes. In this, film, well, see, well, see, that's the whole point of a horror franchise uh, to allow yourself to be able to. You start off serious. Well, not horror. I'm not gonna say horror, but uh, in a slasher genre, you start off serious, and by the fourth film, you've run out of ideas and you enter self parody, yeah. and you just rinse and repeat until it gets stupid, and then you reboot and. Go on See, from there. In that sense, Happy Death Day is already sort of self parodying. It understands that its premise is inherently silly, and it works off of that by allowing its killer to practice pretty much any type of killing that the film can think of because it puts the you know our main character, uh, t- Tree, in a situation where she Terrible has nickname. to be able to. Well, yeah, it is. <laughs> but she has to be killed in various different ways because she's constantly in different uh, encounters with the killer. She's trying her best to avoid those encounters. And so there's always these different uh, elements 
at play that allow the film to just explore different killing methods. And I think that's pretty fun. It's a cool way to sort of pay homage to various slasher films and also get away from the killer's one singular method of killing and elaborate on it. Well, the problem is, because this is kind of, uh, this day gets repeated over and over again mm-hmm. for our protagonist, the problem is, especially when we find out at the end who the killer is, how are they always at the exact spot to kill and then have the means to do that killing? Because once we find out who the killer is, it doesn't seem like they can kind of have the ability to do that. Well, I disagree in some sense. I I think that the film gives us the, the uh, sense that whoever is doing this killing, and I don't know, I mean... The film is two years old. Well, I there's always we can, spoilers in this uh, review. We can, we can, you can we, all, can, we can spoil it. If, uh, if, if you haven't listened by now, yeah. and you're just joining on. By I always like, kind of feel bad for that one person who might tune in accidentally and be like, "Yay! I was just about to watch it." Listen, you're not you're not yeah, spoiling the Sopranos. You're yeah, spoiling true. True. Happy Death Day. Okay, so <laughs> Tree's uh, roommate. Who has been doing the killing the whole time? Lori with, with an eye. Yeah, <laughs> the uh, it does make a little bit of sense because she's constantly sort of failing at doing the killing, and then trying to find new ways to do it. So you can imagine that at this point she's seeing Tree doing all these weird things, uh, avoiding various instances that she's found out about in her past life that she's lived the day before. Um, so it does make sense in some ways that the the killer has to be uh, somewhat fluid in the way that they're going to be doing their killings. With that said, there are a couple encounters that don't really make sense for someone who may not be very uh, adept at killing. Like this is presumably this girl's first time committing a murder. So and she's not that strong or big. So in, in that sense, like I'm thinking particularly about the scene where uh, she runs down the police officer mm-hmm. in. Uh, and then sets it sets the car on fire. That seems like a very uh, uh, tactile maneuver and something that she's practiced before. And as a, a first time offender, I would very much doubt that somebody would be like that nonchalant about committing Just, their first murder and like then flicking you know, a candle out a window. All bad at like the Horatio yeah. Kane. Like, that, I mean, I mean, I think in some ways, like we're supposed to find Happy Death Day. It's sort of a, a horror comedy, and not really think too much about the the serial elements of it. That this I think the fact that they slapped the PG thirteen ratings on it means it's the comedy's more stressed than the yeah the than horror the, than elements. The horror element, yeah. Um, look, I'm fine with what who, who they revealed, which, as I've said before, gloating but not gloating, usually very good at guessing this. I was wrong on this one. Yeah, uh, I think that the, the she would have been probably she was my second choice. First choice was was the dad we don't ever get to see. <laughs> yeah. Because just, she's always hanging up on him and, like, not answering his calls. Yeah. So it'd be like, that, my daughter is such an ungrateful bitch. Dad! You know, the, kill... The, I would say, like, the, that's a testament to this film that you didn't guess it. Because um, I think that there are a lot of films that attempt this style. Where, you know, you have so many uh, characters that could possibly have done, uh, committed the murders. Uh, I'm thinking and then of Jallos bo- particularly. And where they... Your blatant red herrings, or you know, like, right. you know, like that's your red, like yeah. one, of your, one of your red herrings. Yeah, that, that, I mean, by. there are so many films that attempt this, and it's it, it's it seems like having multiple characters would make that a little bit easier. But at the same time, audiences have seen this this sort of thing so many times that it becomes easier for them to predict who is the wrong person, who is the red herring that the the director and the writer want you to think this is the killer. And then you can see through it and say like, all right, well, this is the innocent looking person who really is the killer In happy death day's case. That doesn't really happen. Um, I would say that Lori is not a very suspected killer throughout the film. Um, part of that is because her presence is sort of limited in this film. Which and that makes her a suspect. That's which what she does. Yeah. Which, that's what bumped her up. There's, um, my process of going through like, um, Tim was one of the first ones. Tim being the uh, the gay uh, guy that yeah uh, date, which by the way, just because he watches gay porn doesn't make him gay. Doesn't mean he's gay. He could be bisexual. He could still be into it, or he can just be straight. And that's you know like maybe that was a, a yeah it was a, a night for experimentation. You know, so we all have so one of those. so when he like, she has that moment, it's like, hey, I know you're gay. It's okay. Don't worry about it. And he's like, he, 
Oh, okay. Yeah, he doesn't really make a th- uh, uh, he doesn't actually make much of an expression. So maybe we're left to think like he doesn't really know what she's talking about. No, he kind of smiles, he's like, like kind of like, oh, he's like you you caught me yeah. on my one experimental day. Which we which by those days. Which by the way, who's jacking off with their laptop on their lap and like tissues in hand? Like oh, I'm right. that that's gonna be cumbersome. I'm like. Laptop of my lap. <laughs> oh, set it down now. So I can, like, start, oh, I found the video. I'll start, like, yeah. You know. That's why it's the best. Logis- the logistics of that. So you, so you, you I got problems with the logistics you, of You found he was uh, sort of an amateur masturbator. <laughs> <laughs> Seemed like he hadn't done it very many times before. Well, we all have those moments. It could, you're right. It could have been an experiment. So I could say that I have never been attempting to masturbate to gay porn but you never know you could what tonight you might be in the mood for asian you might be in the mood for ebony uh and sometimes just, special just, occasions just in the mood whatever porn hub brings so, up so, like, yeah yeah Ra- uh, sometimes you really want to let fate decide and hit that random one <laughs> button so maybe that was maybe that was part of it too so or maybe it just maybe it was an auto-playing video and it just kind of auto-played to the next gay porn so you never know or maybe it's not. There wasn't even going to be a gay porn like scene. It's just. Oh yeah, it's just. Yeah, it's like true. in the shower, and it's going to move on to something different. Yeah, like, you, I, know. you never. Yeah, you never know because that could have been like a, a whole cuckolding scenario, mm-hmm. scenario or something like that, where gay porn turned into having straight heterosex. You never know. We're really speculating a lot about Tim in this case, but uh, <laughs> apparently, <laughs> this we, character who has just <laughs> yeah, just like five moments in the film, we're speculating a lot about his sexuality here. Uh, but per, uh, perhaps that's just a testament to the the film's characterization. He he became an uh, to us sort of an important character, and you weren't really sure if he was a uh, uh, the killer or not. Even though towards the middle portion of it, they kind of rule that out. But uh, yeah, interesting. But I think the film does a pretty good job of sort of cycling through characters and not really ever deciding on one in particular. But Laurie is one of those characters that sort of doesn't really make a whole lot of appearances in the film. And she's kind of left as a uh, backdrop character, one that doesn't have a whole big scene that, that you know, she's not a really important character throughout much of the, the film. So we don't see her that much. So that partially is why... It may be hard to pinpoint her specifically, and people might even forget about her. But they do have good hints as, as you get towards the end of the film and you sort of see some of those hints starting to take place. Like the candle in particular. The candle is the same candle yeah. as the, the cupcake. Uh, so you do get some of those hints as to like who it could be throughout. Yeah. I think it's a, a, a well played in that sense. Yeah, don't eat red velvet cake. True. It's what this movie- One thing that stuck out to me about that red velvet cake is... I'm gonna, I gotta test dropping a cupcake on its frosting top because the plop sound sounded like somebody in the effects department was, uh, kind of exaggerating on that. I, I don't think they make the, the sound that the, the effects team had created for that. No, it was like th- a very ploppy sound. What do you think, like, she poisoned it with? Um, yeah, it's, it's hard to say. Like, what, uh, what would be it except, well, you know what though? She is a nurse. So she would have access to sort of some of those drugs that could possibly like stop her heart or something like that. She died in her sleep, so it wasn't like a very violent retching death or like arsenic death or anything like that. So, um, but it'd still be poison. And like when they do the autopsy, they're gonna find she had so, you know a certain sure yeah. You know. No, I mean I don't know how much it's so there again lies the issue with Happy Death Day and the realism of the element is that. For a girl who seems to be committing her first murder, when she's in the baby face costume, she seems to be very good at murder and very confident. When she's committing murder by giving a uh, tree her cupcake, she's not really looking into the future at what might happen when she's caught because she inevitably is going to be caught because the cupcake will obviously be linked to her. And then whatever's in the cupcake, and if she gave her some sort of medicine to stop her heart, they're going to know she's a nurse. They're going to link it to – I mean, yeah. In that sense, very amateur killing. Listen, love conquers all. For me – I mean, lust conquers all. For me, a person who watches Forensic Files every night, 
Yeah, amateur would have would have. <laughs> I would have figured it out uh, as being like the first first listen, day detective. Listen, this isn't Robert Stack's unsolved mysteries. No, it wouldn't be an unsolved <laughs> mystery. That's <laughs> for sure. Be. Somebody would be catching on to that real be quick. Two, two days that the detective like. All right, yeah, it would be like wait for the lab results to come <laughs> back, and we got her. That, that's pretty much it. Uh, yeah, she didn't really think that one through. All of her other schemes would have been better off, actually. Uh, you know, in a baby face costume, when we know like there's a football game going on, so lots of people are wearing a baby face costume. Which, by the there's way, a- worst college mascot ever. That is, yeah, the Bayside Babies. Bayfield. Bayfield. Bay, yeah, Bayside, yeah. I, I thought I thought Bayfield. for a second it was Mayfield. Like, Mayfield, like, yeah. I was like, I know. Oh, the Bay, Bayfield Babies. That is a, first of all, who who would ever pick for your team? We're going to be the Babies. Uh, sounds pedophilic, for one thing. Uh, and then, other than that, it's not a very imposing... I was uh, thinking more of probably some school like from the 1840s. Like, mm, yes, I remember the baby. Yeah, <laughs> the yeah. baby. Mm. I don't know. Yeah. The, uh, and then, regardless of whether you call yourself the babies, you don't pick like some deformed autistic uh, <laughs> um, mascot costume like that, I guess. I don't know. I was thinking it looks more like, like Baby Huey or something. Yeah, it like, does. Kind of, yeah, you know. it looks kind of. Or like Garbage the, Patch Kid. Y- y- garbage Pail Kid. Garbage yeah. Pail Kid, yeah. Tooth hanging out and everything looking, yeah. you know, tartan. Yeah. Um, but it's a good idea for Lori to set it up that way. And she has a ridiculously convoluted, uh, plot after the cupcake uh, method fails. Like she's now put into motion that there's a serial killer that's at the hospital that she works at that she knew about, yeah, knows about and And that, and then she puts a baby face mask on him, sets him free, uh, and then because why would he the, always why would he always chase her though? That's the thing that didn't make any sense. He doesn't. It's Lori that's in the baby face mask. She just sets him free so that Lori can do the killing and then blame it on him later. Yeah, it's still so it's a very convoluted plot. But again, it doesn't make sense with the fact that Lori is a very amateur killer, and Listen, this getting, is her first. You're time. getting it. This is where you, oh, fine. This is where you can compare it to Scream, where you're getting into. Scream three and Romans like motives at the end of Scream yeah. three and how that all fucking wraps up. I mean, to, I, is, we, is, we're being is, super nitpicky here, and I wouldn't even say that I'm that nitpicky when actually watching the film. We're just ma- mainly doing it for the <laughs> podcast itself because I really don't have any problems with the whole, that whole idea of her. Like, I just want to put that out there. Like, that, I've never never had a problem with that. It's just that it's kind of fun to talk about. The only problem I have is the fact that you know it's not tombs. Because you find out with, like, 30 minutes left. Sure, yeah. So it's like, yeah, it ain't gonna be him. Yeah. You know. Yeah, the tombs is pretty a pretty obvious red herring, I would say. It's probably one of the more obvious elements in this. But I do like I, how... I, I did like, too, sorry to cut you off. I did like how we have, like, the, the day where she, like, apologizes to everyone, goes to, like, her, like, re, you know, she's recompensing and she has this tearful moment with her father. She actually goes to her birthday lunch with him and... She's got all these, you know, moments like I'm gonna rectify this, and I got it. And then she kills tombs, and it's your birthday. It's your birthday. It's all for nothing. And it's just that was that was great. Like, yeah, she then, didn't fix it. And then she she skips over all of that, and she's like, "Well, wouldn't you be fucking crazy at that point? Like, sure, you know, like yeah. I did everything I was supposed to. What the hell? Yeah, I mean, I think that." Tombs is a sort of a nice red herring. Like it, it, it does make sense if you're not really paying attention to how long the film has been running, and you don't know the runtime of this film. It's completely. Uh, it makes sense at that time in the film because they leave it to like the last like 70, eight, 70 minutes of the film that it could possibly be towards the end of the film. Especially when we're talking about slasher films, horror movies, they tend mm. to run shorter. Uh, it could definitely be the case that they just kind of wrap it up and that's it. The problem is he's got no connection. But I mean, like, the True. Film, I mean, Grant, he's a serial killer, so he kills. But it's like the fact they just spring like, oh, here, like, could it be him? Could it be that person? Yeah, you know, could it be her physics love profess interest? Could it be one of her sorority sisters? Like, oh no, it's just a serial. Su- su- sure, you know, that's yeah. Th- I mean, granted, that would be like if it ended a- there, it would be super disappointing. Yeah, that would be like a very tacked on like seventy slasher film, like. Well, it was at the end of the day. It was old Buck. 
Yeah. And we, the janitor. We, we didn't see him at all in the film, but, <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. Just, ha- you know. And then walking away. Yeah. Because they always had that. But the thing the thing is, too, one of the things I have to ask, like, why wasn't the guy that she's always wakes up in the morning with, Carter, why wasn't there anything ever hinted at him? Yeah. He was always the super nice guy. So, See, you know why? Because, because, because they want a nice feel good moment at towards the end when but she gets together with why, him. Why? Why isn't he like at least at one point a red herring, like a yeah, like a suspect Be, or something? Because he's someone I, I I thought I I thought Tim at, Tim at first Carter and then Lori. Right. Those those are those are like the three because Lori because she wasn't shown enough and she always had like like oh she's the bitch you know bitchy roommate. Well, so, you know what? Maybe that's Happy Death Day too. Because it, it, it is completely possible that that occurs because if you think about how um, everything had ended, it always ends – and most of the time it ends with him in some way and it begins with him. And so he could have had some uh, impact on her death in that other one and it might not have been Laurie all the time. So – it, they could do like some sort of uh, reversal and have where it's actually you. like actually it wasn't the nineteenth. He was lying to her. Yeah, and... yeah. They could do a reversal. Yeah. So that's an interesting concept. Maybe they do that for uh, Happy Death to You. I do understand why they didn't like really look at him as a suspect because they wanted to treat this as sort of like a Revenge of the Nerds type thing and let her come to the conclusion that like she's been an entire like a, a huge bitch. bitch the entire time and. Uh, you know, that in itself is sort of like exactly like Groundhog's Day, right? Like, Bill Murray is constantly an asshole. An asshole. But, and, but at the same time, like, you got the, like, his roommate, because like, he's his roommate is always kind of like, hey, did you get that fine vagine? <laughs> and you get that one time when she's like walking through, like, you, you know, like, you say that you'll, the only fine vagine you ever get in the get to your hand. And it's like, you're a bitch too. Like, true. Who, who, you know, she's learning and, though. I know, but at the same time though, it's like, you're you're a bitch too, and from what we can gather from you know your personality, you sleep with everybody. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's not saying that you know like being promiscuous is a. I mean, uh, let me put it this way, so I don't offend people. Sleeping with people, a bunch of different people. I don't care. Whatever you can do your thing. But she's like being a homewrecker was yeah. like sleeping with the sure. Which again, it's not really her fault either. The professor's you know the one yeah engaging in that. But she's doing like all this shit too, and like and then she acts like a cold frigid bitch to like all her friends and all that. So like just like you know the fa- you know that to me is just more like hypocrisy. Like like just like a guy like oh you got that fine but Jean like whatever you know yeah. But she's like hey, I think at that you know. point we're supposed to see her transition a little bit more and. And you know, seeing her try to make a a better I know, attempt but the, at being but then nice. You, but she's doing that. But then, like, it, as soon as like you see her doing that, cause she's like, "Oh, I'm figuring it out." And then, as soon as she doesn't have it figured out, she gets pissed off and reverts back to true. You know, true. Yeah. like stamping her feet. Like, what? Again, it makes sense because I would do the same thing too. Like, oh, I learned my lesson. Like, and then you find out, oh, she, fuck, yeah. I you know, yeah. I mean, I think though that. The p- part of the reason why you can... My th- point is her character's shallow. Sure. Even at the end when it's like, oh, I learned it all and like... And then like... I like Carter at the end of the day because he, he's nice. Sure, yeah. In the in the like five minutes of every day that I have interaction with him. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're supposed to... You, I mean, you're definitely supposed to be rooting for Carter in that sense. Like, he's the the obvious outcast character sort of thing and you're you're rooting for him to be sort of more than that with her and y- you get that towards the end and you're just, like it, the, the film is obviously catering towards like younger guys too who are I know that, you know like no I know the ones that are, the ones that are that's like me. I know the ones that are like women don't like me cuz I'm so nice yeah you know, I'm a nice guy. That, you know, that and, crowd. Yeah. I no, I get I get it and I understand it. My point is, at the end of the film, even after everything that's happened, she's still basically like a bitch, but like she's got like a little slightly little bit of moral development. She grew a Grinch heart a little bit. Yeah. yeah. So I mean I mean I she's not overall likable, which is the one thing that this film does different from slasher films, because as you would know more than me, but even I know. 
Who's always the hero in a slasher film? Yeah, the less promiscuous virginal the, character. The, the, virg- the virginal heroine. Yeah. She, like, she's not. Maybe that's why she gets to relive the day all, all the time. Because she's, you know, a whore. A whore. You know? <laughs> yeah. She gets to, you know... It's, it's like a metaphor. It's like It Follows. It's a metaphor for chlamydia. <laughs> it's just... It constantly just follows you. No, for her piece. It just follows you for life. Yeah. But... She, I mean, to me, even at the end of the film, she, yeah, there's growth, but she's not really a likable character. Yeah, she, I think she's just, get, she's getting there. Like, she's, she's getting to be more of a likable person. She's kind, she's kind of learned some things. And, you know, it's that re- reliving of the same day over and over again. If you're going to relive the same day over and over again, hopefully, like you said, in like Groundhog's Day, you want to learn something. You want to do something different if you're going to just spend all your days doing the same thing uh, but at over least and with, over. At least with Groundhog's Day, though, like, like, cause he, Bill Murray lives through the day a lot longer than, mm-hmm. I mean, she only lives through it 16 times. Bill Murray lives through it like fucking thousands of times. Like, he's like, I'm gonna learn the fucking piano. I'm gonna let you know. Like, yeah. you get, got those moments, for, you know, for levity of like, I'm, you know, doing all this weird shit. Why? I got all the time in the world. Why not? Um, but I mean, overall, like I, like I said, I, I don't, at the end of the day, find her to be that likable. Even Carter, I don't really like to fi- like find that. Overall, like, well, just because he's your like stereotypical whiny, like, mm. you know. I'm fairly certain that a lot of people were probably rooting for them. They were shipping them, though. No, I agree, but I just, I'm just saying I don't overall. Maybe in the next one, like with their growth, I'll find them to be more mm-hmm. likable. Maybe but... even they've expanded even further. Yeah. But um, what did you think of uh, the killings in this film? Because there's a variety of them. Pedantic. Oh, you thought they were pedantic. <laughs> well, because it's got mainly it's got a PG thirteen rating. Sure. You so most just about all the you don't get to see because by the time she's dead, yeah, next it day cut, cuts right back. Into so the next day. I mean, they, like the impact of uh, having. To, I mean, granted, I understand. Like, if, like the first killing when she gets you know pinned down and stabbed in the head. Um, the transitioning of like as the knife's being thrusted down, and it transitions into back to the beginning of the day. Thematically, it makes sense, and I like you know for what they're going for. Mm-hmm. I get that, I understand that, and it fits fine, and it works you know works perfectly. Um, but for what it makes for ac- the actual killing scenes, it makes them pretty boring. Mm. You know, nothing like it's like oh that's cool, but it's not because you. You're not getting to see, like, because the main thing when it comes, especially when it comes to slashers, people want to see the gore. Mm-hmm. People want to see, you know, what happens. The, you know, the being disemboweled and shit. Even though, like we said before on the show, leaving it up to the imagination can be a lot better. But the fact that in a slasher film, you can't really do that because it's not what that type of horror is sued for. When it's a much more visual horror, it leaves a lot to be left desired. Mm-hmm. But I, I I understand how it works for the transitions of going back to the start of the day. But I think the killings overall are just meh. Though I did like her hanging herself when she finds out that Tombs isn't, you know. I mean, if that she were to... Like, so when she thinks, like, oh, if I kill the serial killer who I think's the killer... After he already killed Carter, I won't, you know, if I kill him now, it'll be tomorrow and Carter won't be alive. So she just goes and jumps and, you know, puts, you know, a nice noose around her neck and jumps and kills herself. Mm. I like that. That was, you know, really cool. But overall, for the most part, I thought they were just kind of, meh. Mm. I did like too when in the second second one too when the killer's sitting behind and stabbing Nick in the background. Oh yeah, that yeah, reminded right, me yeah. of like scary movie. Like you know, <laughs> it's like come on, you know, when because he's like he welcome to the pleasure dome and playing oh, like yeah, fucking yeah. X music and you know <laughs> like it's a fucking rave and she's like what's going on like not paying attention. He's getting fucking stabbed in the gut over and over again. That to me like reminded me of like scary movie or like yeah. Shriek. I know what you did last Friday the Thirteenth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that they have to. They had to cut away quite a bit. Um, but I think some of the so at least it it does allow for variety in this film. I'll say that that the kills 
and the, the the different sequences allow for a lot of different variety in how the killer kills people and and uh, I think that makes it a little bit more interesting even though you don't get to see a lot it's still uh, sort of interesting in how they they manage to get multiple different uh, killings into one movie whereas slasher has generally one like method of killing and and that's that's it so very interesting. Um, let's see. What else? Um, what do you think of, uh, the, um, the sorority itself? Because that sort of has like a mean girls vibe to it almost. Like they were trying to riff on mean girls and, uh, some of the other, like, uh, obviously slasher films as well because there are quite a few films set in sorority houses and slasher films but uh this one in black particular christmas being one black christmas being one but this one in particular it, it kind of felt like a, a an attempt at mean girls I, I i wouldn't say so i would say it's more just your typical soror like you know look at sorority and frat life because it's the same thing with the frats that we see in the uh campus courtyard Doing like the hazing, right? Of having to sing for countless hours and be the last one standing. They're always in, no. What film can you think of off the top of your head where frats and sororities are portrayed in a positive light? Mm. They're always seen hazing and being mean and bitchy and you know rude and just the worst of the worst because they're elite. The one in particular scene that stood out to me as like being Mean Girls is like when uh, the one girl comes back with chocolate milk. And that sort of seemed oh, like... Oh, when Danielle's yelling at Becky. Exactly, yeah. And that sort of seemed like that, like one scene in Mean Girls where they're like... Uh, in that case, it's, you know, they don't wear a color, certain color Pink, on a certain yeah. day. Pink on... But, yeah. but it was very similar to that scene uh, from, from Mean Girls, I thought. No, I, you're right. But at the same time, it's just... It's the stereotype of they're always, you know... They're always mean and bitchy and mm. ex- exclusive. That's, that's their sti- shtick. To be mean, bitchy, you know. Just think of like Van Wilder, like, yes, we're the, we're the, yeah. me, you know, or you know, Animal House, or they're all like that. Um, Legally Blonde, yeah. But that's if you're a frat or sorority in a film, you're always going to be portrayed as stuck up, mean, miserable assholes. With you know, and I was joking with you, and then they're like. Oh, we don't want to be chunkers. It's like it's 2019. Hell, even 2017. It's all about the booty. <laughs> no, you know. Yeah. I don't know what, like, you know, Yacht Club you're, you're part of, but, you know. It's all about the booty. Eat those fries. You deserve it. You've earned it. It's not It's not 1972 anymore. <laughs> and I think I know the answer to this one, but how did you feel about the pop music injection into certain montage scenes in this film? Well, pop music. I don't even remember any pop music being thrown. Around. Uh, there's one about being confident in when she's actually doing like her uh, consistent walkthroughs of you know from oh, the, from the oh, dorm room to the oh when you know, she through. finally got her like that's fine. You don't you don't mind that? I thought you were gonna be sort of upset about the. There's like three significant montages. No, because that of one. That, no, because the one that you're talking about. No, that's. That's I always I thought that was like in, like uh, stereotypical jest like mm, true that that like when she's like I finally figured out it's too I'm gonna do this and do that the way she's going on her like hi yeah it's this watch out for sprinklers you know that like you know yeah that's one yeah that, I I thought when I saw that I thought that was just like in stereotypical jest like gotta have an upbeat pop song <laughs> gotta eat yeah. she's on true. she's gonna true. win the day you know I thought I thought you wouldn't like the sort of the insertion of those. I mean, like the songs. I'm never, I'm never really a fan of the. Ins- I mean, I get sometimes, but I'm not a huge fan of insertion of actual songs as montage in seri- what would be considered more serious films. I mean, unless it's Mudvayne and yeah. Ghost Ship. Oh yeah, no, I, I, I'll admit, I'm not even a huge fan of that. But, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, no, but I, I'm, not, I'm never a huge fan of it. I think it works in this film, but. Uh, not 
my favorite I mean, I'm not a fan of that type of thing. I feel like I would rather but, just have the normal soundtrack for it. No, I'm not a fan of it either, but I think it's because, like I said, I think it's done because it's done in jest. Because, mm-hmm. again, this film's got its tongue firmly pressed into the cheek, sure, so... Yeah. Uh, I thought, no, I thought it was just done in, you know, s- satirically. I didn't, I didn't take it, you know, like they were doing it for serious. Um, if they were, then shame on them. No, because I'm not a fan of that either. You don't want to see, like, someone gallivanting about with, like, a pop song, you know, a nice pop song going on. Like, <laughs> yeah. ooh, you know. I, I thought, like I said, I thought it was John Tongue and Cheek. The other thing that we have to talk about is uh, the professor who is the love interest of Tree and then also ends up being one of the main reasons why Lori is so obsessed with Tree. Uh, I think his name is Gregory Butler, right? Yeah. Uh, This guy reminds me of Carrie Elwes. Yes, he does. From Saw? From Saw. But much much more... Just dumping his seed wherever he pleases. But a much more goofy version of him. Even and Carrie Elwes and Saw is, is pretty much on the hammy end of things, but th- this guy is quite hammy in Happy Death Day. Um, I just don't like. I don't know. It's just weird. Like, I do. I dislike the fact that not not that it's not weird that he's like hammy. It's more just weird. Like like these students are just like. Oh yeah. Oh. I I mean Cuck your wife. This is great, you know. I mean, I find that it's it's a little bit weird that it becomes such a huge part of the motive between Lori and Tree, and yet it's a very insignificant portion of the film. Like well, cuz it's never hinted at. Yeah. It's it's, it's, it's very it's, insignificant. It's exposited dump onto you to give Lori a motive for why she's doing it. I do wish Which, that they had maybe just uh, done a little bit more with that because you don't, there's no hinting at yeah. it. Yeah, there's nothing to show that that's a thing. If there was something to show that that's a thing, then yeah, that would make sense. The whole point of like creating red herrings is to throw you off the scent. And we've talked about this before, with, like when we reviewed Jallos and stuff that have you know red herrings, fucking every left and right. If you're not le- like leaving at least breadcrumbs to the right trail. And you got all these red herrings about, and then when you find out, like, this is who's doing it, but there was no evidence to show who this is, you've done a shitty job. Right. You gotta, if you're gonna leave breadcrumbs to this person and that person, but not to who the actual person is, you're doing a disservice to the audience. Because they're like, oh, that's who it is. How was I supposed to know? Oh, and now you're expositing why it's them. That's stupid. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I think that they could have done a better job. It would have been it's pretty difficult because then you would have you would have a much more clear avenue of why Lori would want to do that, but um you know, I think they they probably didn't do any more with it because they would have made Lori a prime suspect in that sense. And and in this case, she sort of sits on the sidelines. Uh, but at the same time, you're right. It doesn't really feel fair to the audience to be able to decipher that because we don't know anything about Lori's obsession with Dr. Butler or anything. Yeah. Well, the only thing that we really see is that she says, like, kind of snottily to Tree when she's visiting at the hospital. She's like, I know why you're here. And that's it. That's, like, all we get to the fact that she might have some. And even then, we just know that Lori's sort of, like, the moral uh, high ground here. So she's probably just saying, like, Stop fucking some. Stop fucking a guy that has a wife. So we don't really put two and. There's no way to put two and two together there. All right. So on a scale of one to ten, push up bras because they're doing a lot of the work in this movie. <laughs> what would you give Happy Death Day? I'll give it a six out of ten. Okay. Um. I like the idea. I like the concept. I think it's a good idea. Um, I think overall it's well acted. Could be paced better in parts. I think I think even at ninety six minutes it is a little slow. Even up until like the middle portion of the film, I think if they kind of picked it up a little bit after the first act, um, and make it more interesting. I think the acting job is overall very well done. I do, though, find overall the cast to be kind of just naturally unlikable. Not because of their acting, 
but just because of their overall character arcs. Um, even though Tree does become a better person at the end, she's still a pretty shitty person. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Carter's are Carter's our virginal, you know, angel in this. True, film. yeah, he's basically the the virgin. Yeah. Um, like I said, I like I like the idea, I like the concept. I think it just could have been better executed. I think if it was given an R rating, up those slasher kills would definitely help the film. Though I understand the whole point of like the each death leading into waking up into the day being repeated over again, it makes for an interesting idea. But overall, the it just truncates and makes those deaths feel not worth a damn. Which, in a sense, it's supposed to because she's repeating the day over. So what the hell does it matter? Um, and the fact that we get all these obvious red herrings and then you get to the ending on who the actual person is um with nothing there to really show for outside the fact if you're somebody who watches these types of films and you know if after all the red herrings and you notice know someone that's constantly there but not being shown bright enough that's got to be the person that still that's still not a clue in a, you know clue in of itself that's just a trope in these types of films that's unacceptable yeah, like uh, I don't know. It's 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 hard for me to like say anything hard negative about this film. I liked it, but it's not anything that like I would say is like wow. This is a spit. I think it's a good, enjoyable film, but there's not enough meat there to be enjoyed. It's an interesting idea and concept. Maybe with the sequel they go further into it, but there's just not enough there to kind of make the idea fully developed. Hmm. I'd probably, I would get, go vastly different. I would give it an 8.5. I think, I think it's a pretty fun film. Um, I had a good time with it for those that are sort of sick of like the regular slasher, uh, cliches and tropes and stuff like that, that have been coming out. I think happy death day is pretty fun for them. Um, kind of goes in a different direction. And I like that. I like the whole groundhog's day, uh, with a slasher element to it. I think it's, you know, it adds an enjoyable, uh, different take on the slasher series. And, uh, I think they have a lot of room where they could do different things with this movie. Uh, so I am excited to see what like happy death day to you, uh, offers up for this and where it goes from here. Um, with that said, I think that there are some, you know, there's some flaws with this movie. Um, one of them being that it doesn't offer enough information about Lori. She's sort of on the outskirts of the film. And so obviously when that's revealed, you're sort of surprised. But at the same time, it's no wonder that you're surprised because you don't know that much about her. Um, uh, I think that's, for the most part, the relationship between Carter and uh, and Tree works pretty well. I did root for them towards the end. So um, I, I do like that. I think sort of... Uh, you know, Tree uh, has an alluring quality thanks to Jessica Roth. Um, she does – Jessica Roth is pretty good in this role. I think she has uh, some really good um, facial expressions and just some some quirks that she brings to the character that – I'm glad that, when she finally threw those high heels away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you were ready for her to get rid of those. Uh, but I think that the quirks to her character that she brings to this uh, work really well in sort of – are the one of the reasons why, even though she's sort of an unlikable character, you still are have a tendency to root for her. Um, but that, like, you're right, you're right. I w- wouldn't have been able to search for the word quirky's right. Yeah, she, even though she's a like in a sense a stereotypical sorority girl being cold, frigid bitch, she does have her personality quirks to her that make her yeah likable and relatable. Yeah, so yeah. thank you for grabbing the word that I wouldn't have been able to find. I think that uh, having the serial killer John Toombs in this film may not be the film's best quality. Like it, it's sort of uh, that way is a red herring that doesn't work entirely for it because it's it makes things a little too convoluted. Um, but other than that, I think that Happy Death Day is a pretty fun and entertaining film, enjoyable film for people who like slashers. Uh, it goes in a little bit different direction. So two things I have. Uh... I would say I'd probably enjoy this film if they went the more scream route and went more meta. Mm-hmm. Be a lot more meta with your commentary because they're obviously doing a play, you know, a send up of the slasher genre. So be more meta, like 
you know, with like, like, oh god, like after the killing happened, like, oh, that happened, like, you know. Yeah, and that only comes into play, like, towards the end when they make mention of Groundhog's Day, even. That, you know. Which, God, don't you just hate the Utes? And like, <laughs> not not just that she said, Who's like, Bill Murray? Yeah, that exactly. That pissed you off. Yeah, yeah. That, that did. I, I'm fine with you being like, Groundhog's Day, never heard of it. But if you're like, who's Bill Murray? Like, what do you mean who the fuck Bill Murray is? Like, Yeah, what, that, I knew that would touch a nerve. You know? Yeah. I'm not saying who's Harold Ramis. Yeah. May he rest in peace, you know, treasured icon that he was. But, you know, Bill, come on. Stripes, Ghostbusters, yeah. Lost in Translate, you know. What, anywho, whatever. Point is, like, be like, be more meta in your co- like in the commentary. I think that would have, like, you know, lent a much... Because it's supposed to be a comedy, you know, more comedy than horror. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of the comedy is kind of lost on the fact that it's more just kind of like play to the situation but the fact that they're not being meta in the commentary doesn't make it as funny as it could be that's another thing too as as a comedy it's more of a huh that's you know kind of humorous mm-hmm. not a uproarious like ha ha you know belly laughing film it's a very which and I do love dry comedies but it's very very dry mm-hmm. At the same token, because I I mentioned who I thought, you, and you didn't. Who do you think was the killer in this film? I can't... Re- I mean, I don't really remember, because I watched it on the plane prior to this. Were you so even I, thinking, or you just tuned out and like, oh... I mean, I don't know. I don't really have, like, a memory of thinking of someone in particular, so I'm not really sure. I can't really answer that, because I, I couldn't say now, because I know who it is. So, uh, when I watched it today, I, I knew who the mm. killer was, so I can't really say, but... Um, not sure. I, I don't remember yeah, in particular. So, yeah. Yeah. Maybe a six is too hard, but like I said, I liked it, but it, it's, I think they could have done more with the idea. And this is one of those films that's kind of, at least for me, hard to kind of vocalize why it's like kind of just, mm. it's good, but it's not, you know, eh. maybe I, it's because I expected more from the idea. To be, like I said, maybe I expect it to be too much more meta, much more funnier. Hmm. I don't know. And I didn't even realize until we were done with the film. When you said it was PG-13, I'm like, oh, yeah, it was. They didn't curse. There was no, like, no blood except for the one scene before she enters, which that, that to me was hilarious when she was entering the room where Tombs was when she found out it was Tombs and she's holding the axe. Before she enters in, you can see blood splattered on the wall mm-hmm. and she's entering with the axe. And I'm like, run, like, you know, stereotypical, like, run, bitch, run, don't go, you know. Yeah, and there's this just that one hard fuck drop. Oh, did someone say fuck? She says, oh, fuck, when she's, uh... Yeah, you're right. When the car's gonna explode. You're right. So that's when you know. That's when, when they save that one hard fuck, you know that it's PG-13. That still blows my mind, that a, you get one. You get one. God. And it cannot be a sexual one. God, there's... Because if you're saying, like, you're fucking her, that... No, that's that's not... There... That's a non-acceptable God, one. you really need to watch the... The, the documentary on the... Yeah, the, this film not yet rated. Yeah, yeah. you really need to, because it's just so fucking arbitrary. I know, I know. Well, like I said, the arbitrary rule is that you get one fuck and it can't be a I know, but that wasn't a even a thing fuck. until, like, ten years ago. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's kind of, it, so it had to have been, I don't know, but it had to have been some director who threw a stink about it. Mm-hmm. That was famous, kind of like Spielberg created the PG-13 because he threw a stink about how Temple of Doom was going to get an R- for all of its violence I, uh, and shit. And he's like, no, it's, say it's a four buff. I seem to remember doing some research and the, the fuck thing came about because they wanted to, you saved it for one special emphasis. I can't remember exactly what it was, That's but. stupid. Fuck it's just, uh, just, uh, just the thing they do. You're yeah. still saying fuck. Yeah. What makes, what makes, a the fu- is what counting. makes a fucking surprise or anger Less worse than a fucking like titillation, like can't you can't sexualize it. It's so fucked. <laughs> MPA would not be happy <laughs> with this podcast. I'm just saying though, like don't you think of like like oh, mm. girl, no, girl it is, getting it is uh, you know in this arbitrary, you know, uh, was it emulated? Not emulated. When you burn to death, get burned to death. Immolated. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. Putting an E instead of an I. Thank immolated. you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, she's getting immolated. Oh, fuck. Fine. But like, oh, we're going to fuck. No! Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. yeah. No, no, it's, it's arbitrary. It's the same when they uh, censored, uh, when they say goddamn on TV. And the god is cut out. So it's just damn. Or asshole, and they can't say the whole part of it. Yeah, because you know what? If you're saying God, God damn. Who in, in, in Christian theology, who's the only one that has the ability to damn? Oh, God. So yeah, what? Yeah, yeah, I, don't I, don't know. Know. I don't know. Don't make the rules. <laughs> well, we'll uh, we'll have to check out Happy Death Day to you at some point here. No, nah, I do. I do want. Like I said, I do want to look look forward to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Look forward to seeing it. Yeah. Seeing what they do. It's maybe it's like I know what you did last summer. Like you know, yeah. it's a year later, and like it's her birthday again. She's fucking stuck in the same loop again. Yeah. This time it's her. The asshole cake deliver- deliverer. <laughs> well, in two weeks from today, uh, we will be covering Leprechaun 4 in space. Because we're going to be doing our uh, St. Patty's Day episode a little bit early this year. And uh, so, looking forward to that because I have never seen Leprechaun 4 in space. Uh, it's, we're getting into that territory where I've never really bothered to explore the rest of the franchise. Uh, you know, I have I, seen Leprechaun in the Hood, unfortunately. I have. I have not seen Leprechaun Space. So this I have is not. Be, uh, yeah. Well, this will be a new thing for both of us. Jennifer Aniston making an appearance? I don't think so. Oh, no, darn. No. No. Uh, and then after that, we're going to do Captain Marvel, as we uh, said before. And uh, then we'll have our break. So we'll have two episodes back to back. So lucky for you guys. Unlucky for us because we'll probably get storms on both of those days. It'll you know, be a shit show. You know what I'm thinking about? When does Shazam come out? I the, don't know. Yeah, it's other, pretty, pretty, the other Captain, pretty soon as well. The other Captain Marvel. We're, we're, uh, we're basically getting destroyed by superhero films in the next couple of months here. Because uh, we got Captain Marvel and then very quickly after that we've got I still Avengers don't get, Endgame. I still don't get... What, why is Infinity War 2 coming out a month later? It's, uh... I like why are yeah. they why are they undercutting their own sales? I don't know. I don't know. What do they have planned? Apparently, they don't feel like it's going to undercut it. I mean, at this point, when yeah. you got, I mean, but still, like, no, I know, I know, I, I, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't really understand it either. But I don't know. But yeah, we got, uh, we got, we got two episodes coming out back to back. So stay tuned on those. Uh, thank you for listening tonight. They did the same thing with few, uh, Black Panther and... Uh, yeah, it was uh, very close together. Doctor yeah. Strange, yeah. Black Panther. Yeah. And what the hell was it? No, it wasn't Civil War. No, it was Avengers. Was it, oh. Yeah, Avengers came out like directly after Black Panther. So. Oh, well, okay. Yeah. Well, it didn't stop Black Panther from making a shit ton That's of money. That's true. Oh, April 5th. April 5th so, is when she's, the other Captain Marvel's coming yeah. out. Can't wait. <laughs> so uh, thanks for listening. We will uh, be back in two weeks. For now, you can catch us on uh, Podbean, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, any uh, anything that you can listen to podcasts on, we're on it. Just so, hit that like, hit that's, subscribe. That's right. Hit the subscribe button uh, and leave us a nice review. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash blood and black rum podcast. We also have a Twitter at blood and black rum. Uh, we uh, do have an email address, bloodandblackrumpodcast at gmail.com. You can write to us, let us know what kind of movies you would like us to cover, and we'll take those into consideration. And uh, we hope to see you next time when we do Leprechaun 4 in space. So until then, happy St. Patty's Day. Take care. <laughs>